My name is Valerie Serra from the IMF Institute for Capacity Development. And it's my pleasure to welcome you all to this IMF high-level panel on promoting an inclusive recovery. Over the past few months, under the leadership of Managing Director Kristalina Georgieva, we at the IMF have published extensive research on how to achieve inclusive growth. And we're pleased to put the spotlight on that work today. We recently launched our new online course on inclusive growth, and about 2,000 people have registered so far. In fact, registrations are open until July 20th, so make sure to register before the deadline. It's a free and open course, and you can follow it at your own pace. So go and visit imf.org slash MOOCs in case you'd like to register. Let me use this opportunity to thank the government of Japan for its generous support to the IMF's online learning program. We are now over 110,000 active learners, and we'll continue to expand our course offerings. Later this year, we'll also publish a book on how to achieve inclusive growth with Oxford University Press, and it's already available for pre-orders. The book is co-edited by Professor Barry Eichengreen, Asma Elgenani, Martin Schindler, and myself, and features contributions from many IMF economists and external experts. Today's event will touch upon the key themes covered in both the course and the book. With that, I'll now turn the floor over to Martin Sandbu, European economics commentator and author of The Economics of Belonging, who will lead today's discussion. Please share your comments with us using the hashtag inclusive growth. Martin, over to you. Thanks very much to Valerie. Thanks to everyone for being here. It's uh, it's a pleasure to join you all, even though we're still joining each other through screens, but at least in this way, we can reach each other across further distances, longer distances, and we can maybe reach more people, just like these MOOCs, uh, these courses that the IMF and others are putting together. Uh, today's panel or discussion is entitled uh, Promoting an Inclusive Recovery. Uh, and I think it's a very timely uh, title, a very timely topic, uh, because inclusion, I think, is at the heart of what we're all thinking about. Uh, so I'm very pleased to be chairing this discussion, moderating this discussion uh, between three wonderful panelists who I will introduce, introduce very briefly, because if I say all the good things there are there is there to say about them will never end. So very briefly, uh, join me in welcoming uh, the managing director of the IMF, of course, Kristalina Georgieva, uh, Christina Duarte, who is the uh, Special Advisor to the UN Secretary General and herself, uh, UN Under Secretary General, um, Advisor on Africa, and Professor Barry Eichengreen, Professor of Economics and Political Science at, uh, at Berkeley, University of California at Berkeley. I was saying that inclusion is such a timely theme. Uh, there are a number of reasons why I think that. Um, one is that it's a little bit more precise than what we've been saying so much over the last year, which is that we must build back better. Better, yes, but better how? What does better mean? Well, we're starting to get the answer. Better means more inclusive. That is a good answer to what better means. So I'm glad we'll be talking about uh, how to be more inclusive. Uh, a second reason is that inclusion was very sorely lacking even before the pandemic. We came into the pandemic uh, with a global economy and domestic economies that had left many people behind, excluded many people, and we were struggling with both the economic and the political fallout from that. Then the pandemic hit, and we know very well by now that that also hit unequally. Uh, the poorest countries have been the least well equipped to deal with it, even within high income countries the poorest, those in the more, most precarious economic situations have also been most exposed both to health risk and to economic risk. So inclusion was already lacking and has been made worse in the pandemic. Uh, so it's urgent to address inclusion and promote inclusion. Uh, but finally, and this is a more optimistic reason, uh, it's, it's important for inclusion to be at the center of our attention because Policy is already changing, and certainly policy attention is changing in a more inclusive 
direction. This event is an example of that. The book that Valerie presented and the course that she mentioned are examples of that. Uh, and I'm not the only observer who has pointed out changes in the IMF's policy advice in a direction that we can call more inclusive or more focused on inclusion. Uh, so I think the best way to start this conversation uh, is to, uh, to invite the managing director of the IMF uh, to talk a little bit more about this concept of inclusion and, and start with a very broad question. You know, for the fund, what does inclusion and inclusive recovery mean? What are the sorts of things, the sorts of policies we must prioritize if we want to build back in a more inclusive way after the pandemic? Managing Director Kristalina Georgieva, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Martin. Uh, thank you for agreeing to uh, moderate this panel, also for a great launch of the discussion defining where we are coming from and where we are headed. For the IMF, an institution that is mandated to support macroeconomic and financial stability, growth, employment, improvement in the uh, living standards of people, this topic of inclusion is anchored in exactly that, how inclusion contributes to a uh, more prosperous. We have a great deal of research that is so clear that action hurts not only those left out, it hurts society as a whole. Why? Because we miss on talent. We miss on contributions that could have made to society. They could have solved problems. They could have lifted up the uh, trajectory of well-being uh, over time. And uh, when we recognize that, we then uh, very carefully analyzed the, the quantitative links between more inclusive economy and better performance of this economy. And there is no doubt that inclusion is a moral imperative. Societies are healthier, the social fabric is stronger, but inclusion is also an economic imperative. Then we looked very carefully into the factors for exclusion. And uh, they are different in different countries, but they both fall into two categories, who you are and what you have access to. Who you are, a man or a woman, young or old, white, uh, with one or another religion or ethnicity, also who you are in terms of where you're coming from, what is the level of your family. All these are factors in different countries uh, painting the boundaries uh, for more or less inclusion. And then comes, and access is so critical, access to education, to skills, to good health care, to social protection, to finance, and in today's world, to digital technology, the internet, all of this defines whether one can fully contribute to society or not. So at the IMF, we have taken this very much to heart. Before the pandemic, as you said, Martin, we weren't in a great place inequality was on the rise almost everywhere with the pandemic the naked truth that our society is not good enough to tap into the talent of all its people came for everybody to see within countries if you are low skilled if you are young if you are a woman if you are in contact dependent a sector, you're hit the hardest. Across countries, if you are in a country with strong 
capacity to support its businesses and people, you're more likely to come true. Uh, we saw in this crisis that rich countries provided the equivalent of 28% to GDP in monetary and fiscal support. Low-income countries, only 2% of a tiny little uh, GDP. So what does it mean for the fund? It means that in our programs, depending on country circumstances, we look at tax policies, who we tax, how we spend the money that we generate through taxes to provide for more equal societies. We look at uh, social protection policies. Are they good enough to catch those that be pushed out by a shock as COVID is? We look at access to finance and especially do women have access to finance? And we look at the uh, new uh, dimension of uh, opportunities for green growth, the big structural transformation that, that moving to the new climate economy presents. And on that basis, we strive to formulate appropriate policy advice and link our programs to this policy advice. In other words, put our money where our mouth is. We recognize that we have a lot to learn with others and we are committed to this inclusive way of how we bring inclusion uh, in the work of the fund. So the discussion today is very valuable. This is why we put this book together with others uh, and this is why we value a chance uh, to hear from those on the panel. I value this chance, my colleagues do, but also to hear uh, what is on the minds of our audience. Uh, may I finish, uh, Martin, with uh, one very simple point. We talk a lot about pent-up demand from this crisis. We don't talk enough about pent-up protests. Remember 2019 was the year of protests in Chile, in France, uh, the world. Unless we come out of this as a more inclusive world, that Panther protest is going to hit us. And I think it is now the moment to put the policies in place that would build forward a world that is a fairer, more inclusive world for the benefit of all. Thank you so much. Uh, we are. We should consider ourselves warned, uh, in other words. But but, Kristalina, you also very wonderfully summarized the the sense of opportunity, actually, that that this new way of thinking uh, gives us, because we've clearly, as you illustrate, moved past this concept of a trade off between equity and efficiency. Uh, what you are communicating is that inclusion is a productivity enhancing strategy. We all can benefit if those who haven't benefited are more included. Um, I want to turn to, to Barry Eichengreen. Um, Barry, you're, you are a co-author of this book, an editor, and, uh, and you've authored some of the chapters. The title of the book is How to Achieve Inclusive Growth, which is an ambitious title. And I'm sort of tempted to ask, well, tell us how. But then I know that the, the book contains so much that I'm instead going to encourage the audience to read it because you cover you know, traditional core IMF areas like tax policy, financial inclusion, uh, central development policy areas like education and health, newer priorities such as gender, which Kristalina also mentioned, climate change and, and many others. So instead of asking you to, uh, you know, to say what we have to do on all those things, I want to ask you how they all fit together. So in particular, are these kind of separate policy areas where we can, if we can do something in each, each will bring some good, or do they all fit together so that we kind of have to try to do everything in order to achieve anything? I think that matters for how policymakers think about this. Do you separate these areas? Uh, and it matters for politicians, I think. Are you more likely to get success by going big and comprehensive or by trying to make incremental progress where you can? So how do you think about that after your work on this book? To say that uh, to achieve anything, we have to do everything, Martin, I think is uh, 
a council of despair because we never succeed in doing everything. Uh, the analyses in the book do show that select, targeted, individual interventions can help, but they also suggest that there are important complementarities or synergies uh, among and between different policies and different interventions. So the man managing director mentioned uh, gender inclusivity. Uh, in an obvious sense, policies that break down barriers to education for girls and women uh, are, are, are good for growth. Uh, they uh, in, in endow those girls and women with uh, the skills and training that, that uh, allow them to be uh, more productive in the economy, to become entrepreneurs and so forth. But simultaneously uh, breaking down barriers to, to women's education and their access to external finance, financial inclusivity, for example, so that the women in question not only have the knowledge and the skills, but also the access to finance needed to start a business. Um, you can uh, amplify the gains from one policy by uh, uh, implementing the, uh, the accompanying policy. You both stimulate faster growth and you stimulate uh, uh, inclusivity, equity at the same time by thinking about those complementarities or synergies. So maybe it's not quite, uh, you have to do everything to achieve anything, but the more you do, uh, the more you get for free in the next step, as it were, the easier the next step may get, or the more extra you get uh, when you do something else. But before I go to, to Christina, I'd like to just follow up quickly, Barry, and, and ask you uh, to reflect on, on what Kristalina said. There used to be a sense that there was a trade-off between growth and inclusiveness, or, or growth and, and equality. Um, so, so, I mean, do you agree or could you just reflect on this idea that actually it's a mistake to think that greater inclusiveness must come at some cost to efficiency or growth? Well, this I, I, idea that there's an efficiency equity trade-off is, is deeply in, in, ingrained in the literature of economics or the training of uh, economists. The great economist Arthur Oaken, writing in the 1960s, talked about the leaky bucket and when you... Uh, uh, policymakers attempted to redistribute toward uh, the poor what share of the resources that were being redistributed would leak out of the bucket. I think we uh, have learned over time that the story is more complex than that. So, uh, for example, uh, the IMF has clearly learned, and we heard that in the managing director's comments, that uh, uh, efficiency enhancing policy reforms will be sustainable only if their uh, distributional effects, their implications for inclu inclusivity are, are, are taken into account. When I read the, uh, the, the history of the Greek crisis starting in 2010, I'm reminded of, uh, of the backlash against necessary reforms because of their uh, distributional consequences. I'm reminded of the policy note that IMF staff came out with in 2019, where they reflected on those same lessons. And and this will no doubt also apply to the great challenge of the uh, the carbon transition, which we will get to in, in this discussion. Um, but before that, let me turn to Christina. Uh, I mean, we've just been talking about the poor and some of the world's poorest live in, in Africa. Uh, the region that is your remit. Uh, many African governments are very severely constrained uh, by a lack of fiscal space, lack of fiscal resources, to put it more plainly. Um, and, and both the previous uh, speakers have touched on this. Um, there was a summit of the, on the financing of African economies uh, last week, um, but that just illustrates that it's it's all good to get this advice, the technical policy knowledge of how to make your economies more inclusive. Uh, but when you don't have the money in that sort of challenging environment, how do you go about it? So, so I want to ask you, how does this look from the perspective of African policymakers? How do you feasibly aim to, in, to increase inclusiveness in a situation where the cupboard is bare, fiscally speaking? 
uh, it's a pleasure to be in this uh, conversation, in this conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Martin, allow me to address your question by leveraging my 25 years of experience as an African policymaker. It's the only way I can respond to your, to your question. Um, I do believe that to transform COVID-19 disruptions uh, into opportunities, um, in my opinion, again, based uh, on my experience as an African policymaker, I believe that there are three driving clusters and one game changer, and one game changer. Let me start very quickly with the three driving clusters. The first one for me, a driving cluster, and I'd like to stress this notion, driving cluster is not one measure, it's not one sector. Driving cluster, number one, is human capital. There is no way that we'll succeed in recovering better without putting human capital at the center of policymaking. This is true for Africa, but I believe that it's true for any country in the world. Just three numbers. COVID-19 related school closures have left 215 million children in primary and secondary schools in Africa out of school. According to UNICEF, about 11 million girls may have left during the pandemic and may never return to school. From an education financing standpoint to reach SDG4, before or pre-COVID, the financing gap was around $148 billion pre-COVID times, post-COVID times has increased above $200 billion. As Crystalline has mentioned very well, human capital, human rights dimension, everybody agrees, is, is, is the relevance of providing education and health as basic service to all societies. But besides this common understanding is the only way to generate economic growth for the, for the next 50 years. And to make this economic growth to generate inclusive development and peace and stability, human capital should be at the center of policymaking. We all know that in the first 15 years of this century, the 21st century, Everybody was ex excited about Africa rising narrative. I remember times African rising narrative. But the African rising narrative, Martin, was mostly a story of economic growth based on GDP. And this is an overlay one dimensional. In fact, let's look back and take the lessons. The economic growth, these 15 years of economic growth in the first part of the 21st century, did not generate social inclusion through employment creation, postponing once again the benefits of the, the demograf demographic dividend in Africa. So I strongly believe that, in other words, in the past 50 years worldwide, we have delivered economic growth without income distribution high levels of wealth concentration, and the breach of the social contract. For the next 50 years, Martin, the equation needs to be changed. This BISM model no longer fits the purpose. So the, for me, the first driving cluster for recovering better human capital at the center of policymaking. Very quickly, driving uh, cluster number two from an African standpoint, of course, always. The need to clear identify what are the strategic assets. Africa 2063 has dozens of aspirations and goals and targets. We need to extract the strategic assets. We need to understand which ones provide a higher multiplier effect. In my opinion, in the case of Africa, I would select three strategic assets. Energy, the continental free trade area, and industrialization. These three have a strong multiplier 
effect. Just to remind that in Africa, in Sub-Saharan Africa, we have close to 600 million people lack access to electricity. And you are at the end of the first quarter of the 21st century. And I see people planning go to Mart. In parts of the world, people is planning for fun to go to Mart. In the other side of the world, 600 million people do not access, um, uh, so do not access energy. Continental free trade area, it's obvious, is the only way so Africa can, can benefit for the growing middle class. Otherwise, the growing middle class without the continental free trade area will be translated in, in a negative impact on our balance of payments, trade balance. Industrialization, Martin, is the only way to address jobs, to address the demographic, uh, the demographic dividend. So it's important to understand in this recovering better, in thinking strategically in this recovering better, what are, from an African standpoint, from an African policymaking standpoint, what are the strategic assets? The third driving cluster, the need, again, from a policymaking standpoint, to clear, identify the enablers, the key success factors. And I'm importing a little bit um, a risk management approach. Allow me, a risk management approach. So COVID-19 is giving us a huge opportunity to recognize the strategic role of intangible assets. I think it's important to build roads, to build bridge, train rails, yes. But as important as is the physical in the infrastructure, I believe that is much more important the institutional infrastructure. At the end of the day, Martin, institutions do matter. And effect, effective governance is not an abstract concept that everybody talks. Effective governance is a very concrete concept because it takes to have a vision, strategies, decision-making process, processes, systems, methods, standards. So I think it's time to put institutions as the main enabler to deliver development, development in Africa. Otherwise, we'll not be able to address sustainable infrastructure. We can build roads, roads, but when we look behind these roads, we don't see a sustainable depth on the opposite. No flows to serve the depth. If you don't build institutions, I don't see how Africa will address demographic transition. If you do not build institutions, tell me how we are going to put human capital at the center of policy making. The last one, if you allow, uh, Martin, the game changer. Briefly, if you will. Yes, the game changer is financing for development. We need to tackle illicit financial flows. We need to tackle illicit financial flows to regain political, to regain political space. And... I'd like to bring to this discussion the importance of efficient public finance management systems. Again, institutions. Back to you. Thank you, Martin. Thank you very much. And this last point about financing for development is, is a perfect segue for me to go back to, to Kristalina, because you have just participated in a G7 summit. We have a G20 finance ministers meeting coming up in a couple of weeks. There's COP20 towards the end of the year. In a lot of the, the big questions on global leaders' uh, table, the, the relationship between rich countries and poorer countries uh, and the need for some sort of understanding and trust between them is, is essential to, to solve any of these big challenges. And a lot of that comes down to resources and financing. Uh, just one example is the, uh, the proposal you and, and some of your counterparts made recently for a $50 billion effort to vaccinate essentially the entire or most of the adult population of the world by the end of next year. Um, that's the sort of money we're talking about. Now, I'd like to put to you that behind all the fine words from Cornwall, we haven't really got all the funding we need. But, but what is your assessment uh, of the G7 and of where 
global leaders' commitments really are at the moment? Well, in in, uh, in uh, one short sentence, progress is made, but much more need to be done. Progress is made because there is a spirit of collaboration and uh, coming together on the prospect for the world economy and the importance to support developing countries deal with the pandemic, deal with the climate crisis, be ready to contribute to it, uh, be able to deal with uh, the uh, pressing debt burden for some of them. We got some concrete commitments for 1 billion doses to be transferred to developing countries. Our plan, this is the most urgent task, not to allow vaccines that are already produced, not to make it as shots in the arm because they are delivered in places already people are vaccinated and the needs are met. Uh, but when we look at the road ahead, uh, Martin, to get to a point we vaccinate the whole world, we still need more doses. Uh, Tedros, the head of the World Health Organization, talked about 11 billion this year have to be administered, and we are far, far from that. We have to secure an insurance against the new variants. In other words, we have to produce more than this 11 billion. So we have space for boosters and we have space to recognize that in developing countries, there would be higher level of waste because of refrigeration, transportation, uh, health, health facilities, weaknesses. We also have to be clear that vaccination is not just a vaccine. It is a doctor or a nurse and a health facility, logistics to deliver, and that in developing countries to a very high degree is linked to weak health systems. So in our plan, in fact, the biggest chunk of money is not for the vaccines. It is for the vaccinations and also for the other measures, therapeutics and uh, uh, PPEs and other things that developing countries need to cope with uh, the pandemic. Uh, am I optimistic? I am on two counts. One, we put this plan only weeks ago and by now we have one third of the grants that we call for already secured from uh, public sources but also from some private sources. We obviously have to do more, the not won by, by a long mile. Uh, and the second reason I'm optimistic is that it is in rich countries' own interest. A track pandemic means a two-track economic recovery, and that holds the global economy back to the detriment of everybody. We calculate that accelerating vaccinations would add 9 trillion input between now and 2025. 40% of it will go for advanced economies because they benefit of the world economy operating on a, um, uh, in a higher speed. And one trillion dollars more in tax revenues would enter the coffers of finance ministers in advanced economies at the time when budget deficits are high. That should not be missed. So we will continue our work to press for action. But I want to finish on a, on a broader topic, and it is support for developing countries. It is a two-way street. Uh, Christina spoke very uh, clearly about institutions in developing countries in Africa. They need to be strong. Rule of law has to be respected. Investment in human and physical capital has to be done also on the basis of domestic resources. In other words, 
domestic resource mobilization and quality of spending, conditions for private sector investments, both uh, domestic and foreign, that matters. This is the one side of the equation. The other one is the developed world to step up. I have been um, still living on the other side of the Iron Curtain uh, in the 80s when we were talking about 0.7% of GDP to go for development, to benefit the whole world. Uh, and we are not there uh, yet. We have uh, of $100 billion a year from developed to developing economies to support climate action. Well, it should have started in 2021, from, no, from 2020 to 2030. Okay, we had the pandemic. We can say it was an unusual year. But now we have to get into high gear and deliver this uh, funding because if we don't, the same as with the pandemic, never mind what the developed world does to tackle the climate crisis, we will fall short. So I am, I am speaking loud and clear on a very simple lesson from this pandemic. We are in this boat together. We are interdependent. We depend on Mother Nature. We cannot say, you know what? My end of the boat is fine. Too bad your end of the boat is not. We are all sinking. That That is certainly very convincing and, and moving. And uh, if I remember the numbers from your paper right, uh, the, the grant portion is something like 35 billion, which means there's, there's another 20 odd billion left to secure. And the return on that for rich country finance ministers would be a trillion. As you just said, that's a 50 fold return. Uh, I don't have to be as diplomatic as you. So I can say that it's both absurd and outrageous that this opportunity is not grasped with, with two hands, all hands. Um, Barry, I want to bring you also into this discussion about resources, maybe from a slightly different angle. Um, we, we hear that the pandemic has, has led to higher debt levels everywhere because everyone has spent more. Rich countries have put a lot of money into the pandemic. And we now see that the, 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 the resistance to these sorts of inclusiveness policies often take the form of worrying about debt. Uh, so I would like to ask you how policymakers should think about this trade-off between supporting inclusive growth and debt that suddenly looks a lot higher than, than what anyone expected two years ago. Suddenly, this is the topic du jour, and I'm sure we will be talking about it a lot more going forward. Um, to pick up on what was just said, I think everyone would agree that uh, cutting back on resources for vaccination in the name of fiscal consolidation in order to deal with rising debts would be uh, strongly counterproductive. And I think we can generalize that point that spending cuts taken in the name of debt consolidation that reduce an economy's ab uh, ability to grow end up being counterproductive. Uh, that was the case in the Great Depression of the 1930s in the United States. Debt to GDP ratios rose more rapidly under the Hoover administration, Herbert Hoover being concerned about debts and deficits, than they did uh, in, in FDR's first two terms under the, uh, the New Deal, because those New Deal policies were growth promoting and uh, inclusive. Uh, I think we learned again, uh, starting in 2010, that uh, moving in the direction of, of, of fiscal consolidation uh, prematurely and in, in, in ways that slow recovery end up only uh, raising, uh, uh, reducing the denominator of the debt to GDP ratio and being counterproductive from a, a, a debt sustainability point of view. Um, I wrote a book, what was it? Uh, six years ago called Hall of Mirrors uh, about how history, about the history of the Great Depression affected uh, policymakers' views and policymakers' actions during the 
global financial crisis. And I think we can see uh, the role of history again today, how the uh, premature uh, move in the direction of fiscal consolidation starting in 2010, that lesson has been taken on board now. And we hear the fund and other international organizations cautioning policymakers about that danger. Uh, at some point, we will have to have have to worry about overdoing it. I don't think we're there yet. Uh, and, and just a quick follow up. At that point, uh, will we also have to be more willing to consider debt restructuring policies than, than we have tended to be in the past? I, I, I think uh, that's inevitable. Um, the uh, DSSI uh, uh, put in, in, in place in the early stages of the pandemic and I think now extended through uh, the end of this year is a start. Uh, the official sector has done its part. Uh, the private sector has not. That's the perennial problem with debt restructuring. Uh, uh, Christina mentioned institutions, the institutional mechanisms to accomplish the necessary debt restructuring uh, are imperfect. They're, they're not really there. And this is gonna be a, a serious problem for all of us going forward. It's interesting that you mentioned the private sector because, of course, in many countries, the private sector has been given very, very lenient treatment of its debt situation by governments in the pandemic, and we may still uh, see debt restructuring at, at for, for the private sector at the national level. Uh, Kristalina, very briefly, I saw you nodding, so I just wanted to see if you if you wanted to add a few words about debt restructuring because the IMF has been, you know, sounding a little bit differently under your tenure um, on this than in the past. The uh, um, criticality of identifying a problem early and acting early cannot be overstated, and that applies uh, to a very high degree to how we deal with that. Uh, in uh, the um, early months of the pandemic, David Malpass and I uh, came, it was in April, calling for debt service suspension because it was very clear that if the economy is in a standstill, Poor countries cannot possibly serve their debt. This debt service suspension, however, only kicks the can down the road. And if the can is too heavy, you would inevitably break your leg kicking it. So this is why the second message we conveyed was we do need to identify countries where debt is not sustainable and move towards debt restructuring early. And that got the name of common framework for dealing with that, which now having three candidates, Chad, Ethiopia and Zambia, asked for treatment under the uh, common framework. I'm uh, pleased to say that we are seeing progress on chat. I hope we would be successful to bring these cases to fruition. So other countries, because it is not only these three countries that are in a difficult situation, other countries step forward early. A very important difference between the uh, debt service suspension initiative and the common framework is private participation in the common framework there has to be equal treatment to public and private creditors. Again, we have to see that work so we can then expand it further. There have been improvements in uh, debt negotiations over time in how uh, debt, debt, uh, unsustainable debt is uh, uh, treated, especially with uh, introducing uh, clauses in the debt, in the, um, uh, debt deals that are allowing for a, a project of unsustainable uh, debt, the so-called collective uh, action clauses. But in a highly diversified environment with so many different private creditors and public creditors, uh, 
I must admit, we are not where we should be. We have to continue to work relentlessly, hopefully building from the DSSI to the common framework to a much more prudent approach to debt restructuring. Uh, and at the fund, this as a top of mind uh, priority. I want to finish with the following. In the United States, in Europe, there is now a lot of discussion around inflation. Inflation transitory, is it not? We still have to find out exactly where we are. There is clearly uh, a transitory uh, aspect because demand picked up and there are still supply disruptions. We see it. We have never been in a situation when a recession was caused by consciously stopping production and stopping consumption. How we're going to come out of it, we have to be watched, we have to see. But one thing we know, advanced economies on the back of policy support and vaccinations are moving much faster towards higher growth. High growth is great. It has good spillover for the rest of the world when it comes from advanced economies, but growth also means that accommodative monetary policy may be withdrawn sooner than we anticipated, especially here in the United States. If you are a corporate or a sovereign with high level of dollar-denominated debt, good news, strong growth that leads to changes in monetary policy may easily turn into bad news for you. And then ricochet back in the rich world if we don't handle it properly, if we are not uh, taking proactively uh, steps to deal with that. Sorry, I took a bit longer, but this is a very, very, very uh, topical yes. issue uh, for us. At the very, time. very important. And, uh, and I, I, I hear a strong message of uh, hold your nerve to the world's monetary policy makers. Uh, I would like to talk a little bit about climate change and the time we have left. We won't do it justice because we only have five minutes. With your permission, I'll go two minutes over since we started late. Uh, but it's it's a topic that's so much at the center of this theme of inclusion, uh, partly because, of course, future generations have to be included. That's why we care about climate change. And partly because the policies we choose to address climate change uh, have strong distributive effects and sometimes, unless they're mitigated, will will hurt the poorest the most uh, so i'd like i'd like us just to reflect briefly on that in the in the context of inclusion in the few minutes we have left and, and maybe christina i can ask you first uh, africa is particularly exposed to climate change uh, partly but not only because so many of its people still rely on agriculture and it's an agriculture that's very vulnerable to climate change uh, so what are the main uh, threats as seen from africa or the main requirements uh, for global policy action on climate change as seen from Africa. Very briefly, please, because we're almost out of time. Uh, uh, I, will, I will try very quickly. If you allow me, um, uh, Martin, first, uh, uh, from an African standpoint, to discuss climate adaptation, climate change, it needs to be discussed with energy policies, energy mix. Um, Africa faced a permanent trade-off. Climate action energy mix, and the trade-offs to deliver green growth. We need to recognize that Africa is already playing a leadership role as far as green world is concerned. Africa, is, as you know better maybe than I do, is one of the least contributors to greenhouse gas emissions through forests, and uh, which actually uh, works as a sort of carbon, carbon, carbon sink. So Africa, Africa's leadership role should be played, in my view, under a global mutual accountability scenario where we can factor in these, uh, these trade-offs. From a climate adaptation standpoint, what we know? We know that Africa countries um, have been spending between 3 to 5% of their GDP annually to address these issues. In 2019, for example, uh, African countries spend, spend between 2 to 9% of GDP in responding to climate events and environment degradation. Uh, 
the needs, uh, the African needs to address climate change and climate adaptation are huge, huge. If we compare to fiscal space, doesn't even doesn't make sense from a from an economic from an economic standpoint. So. I think we may have lost the connection uh, with Christina. Uh, so I will, I will, uh, even if you're back, I will say thank you there because we're running out of time. Okay. And I will ask Kristalina, uh, but we, we heard everything you had to say before that last two seconds. I will ask Kristalina to give her final remarks on this same topic to, to finish us off, as it were. Uh, what are your reflections on how international leaders, the international community together, most <laughs> importantly, most crucially has to do precisely to address uh, the green transition? Uh, not there yet. Um, I, I want to finish with uh, Tolstoy. Tolstoy wrote, one of the first conditions of happiness is that the link between nature and man shall not be broken. We are very close to breaking this link. Not only our happiness, our existence is at stake. And I don't think that we are acting yet with the serious that this requires. Yes, we make commitments to 2050, but what we do in 21, 22, 23, 24, 25 is going to be absolutely critical. To turn Tolstoy into IMF lingo, macroeconomic and financial stability are at risk unless there is a very substantial and rapid structural transformation that takes us to low carbon intensity, climate resilient economy for our children. And to get there, we need three things. We need to price carbon, which we are still in many places reluctant to do, only 23% of global emissions are priced, and they are even not at the level it should be, actually. Um, we have to put a massive public investment effort to put the infrastructure for green growth in place and for climate resilience in place. And we have to take care of the businesses and the people that are on the short side of our stick when it comes down to this transition because they are in high high uh, carbon intensity sectors or high vulnerability. And we have to do all this at the same time and do it fast. Uh, yes, I'm thrilled that climate is finally front and set on the agenda, but like with the vaccinations, dealing with the climate crisis requires ambition on a scale and it requires speed. And on both, we are not quite there yet. Thank you very much. It's time for me to, to bring the uh, conversation to a close, I'm afraid, but I think that's a good point to end in 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 my very own words. I would paraphrase that as a, as a message to world leaders that they must do better. But we are, it seems, finally working in the right direction. And, and this effort from the IMF, I think, is an example of that. I would very much like to thank all three of you uh, for your participation. I would like to thank the audience uh, for following. Uh, and I think we clearly have our work cut out for us. Uh, the conversation tonight's or today's conversation may end now, but the broader conversation does not. So, so keep it up, all in the audience. Keep following these issues. Read the book. Follow the IMF's work. And to the IMF, I'd like to say, keep up the good work. Uh, but with that, uh, the only other thing I want to say is thank you, everyone. Goodbye and stay safe. <laughs>